Good afternoon. Welcome to Sawcast number 16, brought to you courtesy of Jocko Productions. And today, we're joined by our 16th guest, who was a member at McVie Sog. He was on RT Idaho for a short period of time, and this is a part of our ongoing series. I'd like to welcome to the show today, well, I knew you as Captain Michael Byrne, who went on after SOG to have a rich career, and we had some time together at, the, at CCN, at Command and Control North, which was in Da Nang, and that was the northern base for the MACV SOG operations that went on in the secret war for eight years. Mike, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, sir. And, uh, you know, you, you and I got to know each other through, I guess, Lynn Black first, because you had known Lynn, and then um, we had a special mission that we needed a high-tech technician to take with us on a target. And uh, you wound up training with us for the mission. This is in April of 1969 at CCN. And at that point, you were working in S2? Yes, I was in the S2 shop. So for our, some of our viewers, S2 was the intelligence side of things. And, uh, this is uh, after I escaped from Project Gamma down in Four Court. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, with each of our SOG casts, we always interview people that have been involved in SOG. And I think your story is fascinating because there's a lot of confusion about Gamma Project, Sigma Project, and were they in SOG or not. So maybe in your case, if we could go back, if you want to start at the beginning a little bit on that, because there's some fascinating sidebars to that whole part of your life before you came up to SOG. And uh, how'd you, so maybe we should start with you be, came into the Army, decided to become an officer and a gentleman, and then take it from there and you wind up at Gamma. Uh, I was commissioned in AIS out of college. Oh, is that right? And AIS, people say, what, what the heck is Army AIS? Intelligence? Army Intelligence and Security was a branch before MI was created. Like ASA was a branch before they talked about NSA. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. And so um, when I came on board, um, I was trying to get to SF, but AIS branch couldn't get any quotas for it. So they said, okay, we'll send you to Ranger School and send you to Airborne School, and you can be quiet and, you know. <laughs> AIS was really looking for bona fides with with the the combat arms right you know you can't have a bunch of of nothing uh guys running around trying to talk to to battalion commanders and so forth and, and have any credibility so you know you you get the ranger patch you get the airborne patch and, and you that get that gets you in the door but again you're very modest here you went through ranger training and this is after airborne training Yes. Right. So you get your five jumps in airborne training, which is a three-week training course. And then at that time, ranger training was not no slouch. Uh, is it now? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was telling somebody, we were talking about Dahlonega, and yeah. I said, yeah, I don't live too far from there now. And I can remember standing out in the Yona River, I think it was, in ice water in the middle. I was a uh, December ranger. Oh. And... Uh, learning to tie knots they had these posts out there in the water and so we stood in the water and froze oh, our butts off and yeah indeed and so on like that so anyway yeah graduated went to infantry officer basic um had a short stint with uh, mech infantry battalion at fort benning and volunteered for vietnam i said you know <laughs> get me out of here <laughs> i gotta get someplace that it makes more sense vietnam so anyway, was better in georgia Vietnam was better than Mech Infantry at Fort Benning. Yes. Yes. So, so anyway, um, they uh, they assigned me to Vietnam, and for further assignment to this detachment B five seven of Fifth Special Forces Group, and detachment B five seven was uh, Project Gamma, and Gamma was a um, an intelligence operation, <clears throat> and what they did was they, they took CIA-trained case officers, people who had learned how to recruit agents and, you know, do all that. Hum and did you have to learn the language, too, or did you have interpreters no, working no, with no. you? No, no, I had an interpreter. Okay. My languages were French and 
in Russian. Yeah, my foreign <laughs> my foreign language is English. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I get that normally after a couple of beers. Yeah. So, so anyway, I showed up down there. This this organization was in a building that was back behind the Dairy Queen at uh, at, at SF headquarters at Fifth Group headquarters. Oh, you know what? I, that that Dairy Queen was for me one of the most psychologically damaging moments of my life. <laughs> at the end of my first tour of duty, I'm going home. No. At the end of my second tour of duty, I was going home and doing beach guard, and the NVA bombed that place. It blew up the ice cream parlor. Why all, would they do that? I don't know, but all the rest had to go downtown for their ice cream. It was <laughs> really st- I'm sorry, but go oh, ahead. It's it's so you're behind the dairy. Yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I go in there, and I, I get the intro, and they said, we're going to send you down to a Special Forces A camp, A421. The four meaning four core. Right. Camp oh. number 21 of yeah. four core, which was an old French fort that was right on the Cambo- Cambodian border. We could look out and see Cambodia from from the uh, uh, from the, the camp. From the camp was, perimeter, yeah. It was built on a, a little hill, probably, you know, 300 feet, 400 feet tall. Yeah. And we had a 106 recoilless rifle up on top of it. And this part of four core was just flat. Flat. Absolutely flat. And it was covered with water. And so, you know, we ruled anything that was within our with within yeah. our eyesight as long as we could get permission from the, the province guy to To, to open shoot. fire yeah. on your 106? Yeah. Oh. Uh, we got enemy in the wire. Can we shoot? Uh, yeah. <laughs> One of the vagaries of of service there anyway <clears throat> so they sent me down they yeah. put me in a jeep i'm i'm uh first lieutenant with a couple of months in service and um they give me a jeep and a portable photo lab and a, a money box that had a bunch of money in it and they sent me down there and said, okay, go down and set up an operation here at uh, A421. So I went down and introduced myself, you know, yeah. had that Green Beret and the whole works. Only my name was Doucette. Mike Ooh. Doucette. <laughs> Doucette uh, was my best friend back in high school. Sure. And so, you know, I reacted to the name. You always want to, if you give an alias, you want to keep your first name. Right. Because you immediately turn around when somebody says, hey, Mike. And... Um, you know, and, and so anyway, so yeah. I got down there. They gave me a bunker, a big concrete bunker that used to be the the command center for the old French detachment that was right. there. And they, and then they, <laughs> say, <laughs> I'm laughing because I tapped the table, and that's a no-no. Indeed. <clears throat> so uh, they said, you know, recruit a principal agent and start running folks across the fence into uh, Cambodia. And report back on what's going on because this is the, the ass end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Sure. And um, so uh, I did, and I tried to do the traditional vetting and all that good stuff, and finally got one. And um, uh, we were about to start doing stuff, and headquarters got, well, I digress. Um, I thought that if you're in a Special Forces A camp, you can't stay in your bunker all day, 24 hours a day, you know, and right. not go out on operations when everybody else is going out on operations. So I went out on operations, and I wound up with a couple of Purple Hearts from that. And, wow. uh, you know, uh, but it was it was all good. I mean, good learning. And, yeah, uh, and you were developing good intel on the way. But headquarters <clears throat> didn't like the idea. You know, really of you and an officer in the yeah, field. You're out there going around having fun, shooting stuff up. <laughs> and so they said, you know, stay, stay at home. Yeah, yeah. Don't go out and do this stuff. So anyway, uh, I said three bags full and <laughs> promptly forgot the instructions. <laughs> and unfortunately, I went out on an op. We got put in on the top of a nearby mountain. And as we were coming down, the only path down from the mountain, which I advised against us taking. Right. We were supposed to be lifted off by a helicopter, but the helicopter got canceled for some reason. They said, yeah, just walk down. So we walked down and we walked through uh, uh, a 
claymore ambush. Oh. And these claymores were like you take a top of a 50-gallon drum. Right. And you cut it off, and then you pack the inside and shape it. And uh, we got we got hit with those on the way down. As careful as we could be, we you know it's just stuck. It's, if you oh, want yeah. to get out of there, you got to walk down. And um, my principal agent got cut in half. Basically, he took a oh he took one right in the gut. And uh, so then I had to report to the <laughs> to headquarters that <clears throat> the principal agent was was uh, no longer with us. And they said, did you go out on operations? I said, uh, yeah. And they said, okay, get a collection effort going now. You know, <laughs> yeah. your time is limited. If you don't get it done, you're going to be working in the mess hall or something. <clears throat> so I went out, and, and I knew that there were some locals who wanted to make some money. So I trained them, equipped them, sent them across the border with a bunch of money, and um, what I didn't realize what the, was that the Cambodians were very fractionalized. They had all these different factions that, that wanted to kill the other factions and so forth like that. And so uh, when I sent them across to go spy on the, the Khmer Rouge and so forth, what they did was they decided this was a time to have a, a little war now that they had guns and all the other stuff. So they went in and they went on a rampage across the border. Well, they sent back beautiful great intel intel reports, and I sent them up to headquarters. We had a <laughs> KWM-2 Alpha uh, high-frequency net yeah. with one-time pads, and I was a diddy bopper back then. Wow. So it was Meaning CW. Meaning was using Morse code. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and they were delighted until the ambassador got called in because one of the people had been captured and interrogated, and he spilled the beans on everything, including this Lieutenant Doucette that was non-existent. And so anyway, make a long story short, I got, a, I got an urgent message from headquarters saying, Doucette, must leave and be as far away for as long as possible. And so um, and they disappear. called me back to Natrang. Yeah, yeah, basically disappear. I went up there and they said, you are hereby sentenced to i -Corps. <laughs> And I said, okay, three bags full. And went over and talked to people about what was available. And they said, well, we've got this one organization called Command and Control North. And... Uh, I said, okay, what do they do? It's intelligence collection. I said, yeah, okay, sign me up. <laughs> and that's how I wound up going up to CCN. Now, interestingly enough, the day that I arrived there was the day that Jack Warren had everybody out on the oh. on the helipad. Right around January 1st, 1969. Yeah, somewhere yep. right, right around there. And uh, he had the body bags of... Uh, of a recon team three had, three americans from uh yeah. i forget the team's name right now but yeah they had gone out uh halls hall and uh i forget the third third american but uh and the all the indigs lived and they had a that was another psychological aspect of that case but so the body bags are there colonel warren comes out and, and this is your welcome to ccn yeah and he's dipping his hands in the body bag and holding up entrails and shaking them at us and lecturing us about, you know, apparently what happened was they just got lax. They were waiting for exfil, and, you know, they declared it index and, and uh, all sat down and started smoking and joking. And an NVA patrol walked right through the middle of them and, uh, and then left the bodies. So, And they may have had a couple of drinks celebrating New Year's Eve. Because it was December. Surely it was not. No, 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 no. SF, no, 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 no. they would never do that. Not on mission, yeah. <laughs> but Halls, I went through uh, combo training with, and he'd been, he came in from uh, Canada. Uh -huh. He was a Canadian, but he was SF fully with us and uh, one of the good men that went down that day. Wow. And that's your introduction. So that was the introduction. I'm standing there trying to figure out, you know, where I'm going to sleep tonight, and in I'm having in, Could, entrails shaked, shaken at me. It's a, a mandatory formation, right? In a mandatory formation, and then that 
got over with, and uh, and it was like, okay, now what? And <laughs> we all went down to the club and yeah. had a drink. And who was it? Was it Speedy Gaspard or Bill Angel? No, Bill Angel been, was there then, because I think this yeah. was before Speedy came in. But turned around and cold decked somebody who was sitting next to him and just laid him out flat on the <laughs> floor. <laughs> and, I thought, and Bill what, Angel was Major what Bill I, Angel, what who I was the XO got, yeah. at FOB4 that became CCN at that time. What have I gotten myself <laughs> into? You know, these guys are lunatics. So I got, assi- I got assigned to um, the S2 shop. And uh, since I was known as an Intel weenie, Indeed. And so uh, I went in there and started, you know, doing S2 stuff. And uh, then I had an opportunity. I, I had learned a little bit about um, tapping into communications. Bar tapping. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> what I call it's black bag. Yes. <laughs> and so um, I, uh, I, I had a little trip over to NSA and got some equipment from them and came back. And you had new state-of-the-art equipment at that time, yeah, which that was, was different was than what we had. We used stuff. to have the little cassette with the wires, but yours was more yeah. state-of-the-art. That's it why. was, and it had uh, you know, a, a CRT on it, and I could look up one way to see how far the next terminus was and yeah. look down the other way, see how, and then it recorded as well. The trouble was, one, you had to find a wire, and two, you had to attach to it, and then you left the little bag or... Or whatever, and and um, waited for it to fill up with yeah. stuff that you could take back. And I don't know how many missions we ran with that, but we never did hit a wire. No, we would look at it on the photos. Yeah, and there's the darn wire. You can see it. You can see it strung along the trees and so on like that. And uh, then we get on the ground and we go, and and there was no wire. Really, it just disappeared. Yeah, <laughs> I know there were several successful operations. Uh, other people had but um i we, never we tapped him during the course of a regular mission twice up in, in laos and one time they sal would go up the pole tapped in it would covered the wire down the pole with mud yeah and we sat there and we had an ambush set up and then we later we had to leave and we just pulled it down yeah same same later and the cia cool. told us even if you can't hear anything tape because we will amplify it a hundred times because the NVA phones, when you put them in a the cradle, they still work. Ah. And that's what it's like to us, that's strange. Cause you know, yeah. in the U.S., you close, you put your phone in the cradle, it's done. <laughs> you don't hear anything. But yeah. there, they didn't have the sophisticated equipment that Beltel had. Ah. And so we tapped. But in your case, you're prepared. You had state of art equipment. Ready to go and never got the wire. So then uh, you, somehow, you and Lynn Black connected in March of 69 I'm near the end of my tour of duty as a team one zero for Idaho and they came up with this mission for Mugia Pass and oh, we yes. and we and Lynn goes we got to get Captain O'Byrne on this mission for our tactical and uh, then we we trained up for that mission for a little bit extra time extra weapons you know that was crazy right oh yeah yeah <laughs> totally crazy this is a major route out of North Vietnam feeding down into the Ho Chi Minh Trail through Mugia Pass. They wanted us to go sit up on the edge of the pass and call in reports as <laughs> convoys were cutting through. Right. Because then I guess they were going to come bomb them or something. But Well, yeah, we had the mission, and, and it got canceled at the last minute as we were on the helicopters heading north. And they canceled the mission because another aircraft got shot down over that target. And for a sidebar on that, at the reunion, soar, I don't know, four or five years ago, I'm talking to Cleet Sinyard, who will be our next guest on our SOG podcast. Um, Cleet was there. He came up to me and said, you know, the, your pictures in the book from uh, on the ground, the picture you guys are getting inspected. What was that mission? I said, we were going to go up to Mugia Pass. He goes, oh, that mission. He says, they tried to get us to go up there. We said, no, it was a suicide mission. <laughs> <laughs> this so, is true. Yeah, so we never had that intercommunication. Yeah. You don't learn this until 45 years later. Yeah, I think I had a, a, a high freak radio with me, a little Delco 5300. You had some extra special stuff. I forgot yeah. what it was now. Cause, uh, but we were going to go in heavy with a five-man team with five or five of our indige and uh, with Buku, whatever. 
So we are I fortunate, go my friend. Indeed, that that's we why we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're here today. Yes, indeed. So I go home. Lynn Black takes over Idaho. You go back to S two, and at some point, you wind up working with the Hatchet Force, and later become the one zero for one of the best recon teams in camp, which was RT Rhode Island. Yeah, Rhode Island. Um, Dan Thompson, who was briefing with me today, right, um, was the one zero of Rhode Island before I took it, and um, I forget exactly what the circumstances were where the the one zero slot came open, but they said, yeah, we'll, we'll take him. Meadows was down at, the, was the commander. For Recon Company at that for time. For Recon Company, yeah. And this was the legend, Dick Meadows, who when he was a CCC as an enlisted sergeant, set a rec- world record for 12 POW snatches out of contours. <laughs> Oh, POW snatches. Yeah. You remember that. It was well, a crazy we, time. Well, yeah. And we always mm-hmm. had that uh, for us, uh, even in 68, was if you get a POW, you got the $100 bonus in five days. Oh, yeah. And then later they jacked it up. Yeah, it became 30 days CONUS y- yeah, R&R, see, I, you know. I forgot that Who could that avoid part. that? It, everybody wanted to go. So Dick Meadows did such a good job there. He, he had a direct commission to a captain. Yeah. Then he wound up as a captain of the recon company. And when I left, he was a captain. So that's what you're talking about here. One of our SOG legends as captain of recon. And the rest of you wind up on the RT Idaho, uh, Rhode Island. Wasn't he uh, on loan from uh, First Special Forces Group? I don't know. I that's that's, an off, the, that's yeah. above my pay grade. <laughs> I just knew that he was there. And it's like one of our legends. Yeah. Kind of like. He's amazing. Absolutely. absolutely amazing. Sure. Okay. So then I, I wound up taking over. Um, Rhode Island, and uh, we ran a couple of missions. The one that I just briefed on at the, at which the is kind here. of noteworthy because you talk a little bit about a bright light. How you you start out with planning for one mission. You're actually at the launch site, right? At the launch site within hours of launch to go in on a black bag to try which to is find a wire, a wire that we had seen, and um, and all of a sudden we get a call. We got a bright light. Get ready. So we had to get rid of all the extra ash and trash and the the black bag and so forth like that. And um, I think it was 25 minutes from the time that we got the call, like 16:35, and till till we got on the on the choppers, on the choppers heading to towards launch. the mission. And then you know it was 30 minutes to get there and 15 minutes to get us on the ground. And then, then right, we and just off. just for our listening audience, for those who are not familiar with a bright light, there are different missions within SOG, but the most dangerous by far was a bright light mission because that mission is designed uh, where a recon team will go in to help another team that's in distress or overrun, or for down pilots, or sometimes there would be a plane crash, and we had to go in to try to get recover any critical instruments, intel, paperwork that was from the aircraft. And people. And people. Yeah. And uh, they were by far the most dangerous because after a team would be in trouble or a plane crash, the NVA knew that we were coming back. And so Bright Light, you went in heavy with ammo, extra hand grenades, uh, body bags, maybe a canteen of water, bandages, no food because you knew you are going to be in and shot out. The only question was how long could you get the mission done? In your exactly. case, you did the whole thing, but it's dramatic. Talk about it, how you get on the ground and what you're discovering. Oh, and what what triggered the Bright Light mission? The team was... Yeah. RT Missouri. Right. Which was um, three Americans and five of the Indige. Right. The little people. The little people. That we <clears throat> affectionately call little people because... That's right. Yes. I think they were Tahan or... or yeah. I, I forget. Anyway... So um, they were going after the PW snatch, you know, that oh yeah, that bright symbol that's sitting off in the distance of thirty days on oh. on the beach at Waikiki or we whatever. We dreamed about that. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so they had gotten themselves inserted and um, were up under the triple canopy below an NVA camp that was sort of on one of these high crested hills. Uh, a couple hundred meters from the the base of it, where there was a stream up to the to the peak of it, and just before the military crest, there was an NVA camp 
that was sitting there. So the team had gotten in. They would gotten in without being uh, discovered, which is kind of amazing. I, I never did find out where their original landing zone was, but they may have walked for a while to get there. Anyway, they got there. They got up close. They got to the point where they were observing what was going on, and they called for aerial rocket artillery, which is a um, you know, Cobra, Cobra gunship, eight-inch rocket artillery, basically. And um, they didn't have a good position fix on the team. They thought they had a good position fix on the camp. Anyway, uh, Captain Cheney, who was the uh, the one zero of of Missouri, called for them to fire, and they fired a barrage of the eight inch, and it came down in the trees right above the RT. Whoa! And um, that that must have been horrendous. Um, so the three Americans were were Captain Cheney, um, Sergeant. Um, uh, Williams, I think it was. No. Williams was on the bright light. Yeah, he was on the bright light. Uh, Wilson. Wilson, yeah. yeah. And Specialist Mallory was the one, too. And um, uh, each one of them got hit. And uh, one, of the, one of the little people had a sucking chest wound, and uh, the others were all, you know, miscellaneous. Well, and one wounds. of the Americans had the top part of his skull missing. Yeah, that was Mallory. Yeah. But we didn't discover that. And when the first call came in, a lot of confusion leading up to this mission. Uh, they didn't know where they were. They didn't know exactly how many people they had because we're hearing from Wilson, who is completely paralyzed except for his for his right arm, oh. which is holding the radio. The ERC-10. Which is he's Smaller. talking yeah. talking upstairs to somebody, and that's what triggered the bright light. So we get in there, and we don't know where they are. We don't know, you know, who's who, but we brought a stretcher, and we brought the doc because we knew there was at least one person who was non-ambulatory. So um, we start heading for what we think is the correct direction, and we finally get in touch with uh, Wilson on the ERC-10, and he kind of conf confirms that we're heading in the, in the right way. And uh, so we get into you know, patrol mode and start heading that direction. And suddenly my point man stops and signals for me to come forward. And I came up to the forward and he says, there's an American up there in a clearing. So we, we looked up in that clearing and there was Specialist Ford Mallory and he was laying on his back, spread eagle, and the top of his head seemed to be missing. You could Basically, see that from where yeah, you were. The skull was exposed. But even there, if he's a spread eagle, you must have thought, wait a minute, is this a setup? Yeah, that's what I thought was a setup. So instead of just rushing in and checking him out, we, you know, moved oh, around, yeah. checked out the area, cleared it for, which all took time. Sure. <clears throat> Found out that Maori was still alive, and I hope he's still out there someplace and enjoying life. But, the top uh, of a skull missing. So now we've got, now we've got the second non-ambulatory that we know of. Right. And so that's Captain uh, Cheney. No, this is Maori okay. because the first one wasn't specified who it was. I oh, think, okay. You, you know, didn't know at that Wilson point. was saying you're, you're still finding people. We're still finding right. people. And um, you you saw Maori. You secured the area. Yeah, secured the area. Out. And then we started moving out. And. Because Mallory was in an area that, that had some open spaces around it, we figured out the emergency landing zone should be there. We've right. only got one stretcher. He's the second, you know, non-ambulatory, so, you know, we could at least tug him over to a helicopter. Sure. So we found a space and designated that as the emergency LZ. Then the rest of us started heading up. And you left a couple of tro troops with him. Left two of our four. And Didge. Little peep. Yeah. Yeah were there and they provided security and kept an eye on the LZ and so forth. And so we went back up and as we were coming up the hill, <laughs> sure. talking to Wilson and he was, he was talking us up. He had used a couple of pen flares to let us zero in on him. We came up and the first person we ran into was Captain Cheney. And Captain Cheney was face down on the ground and uh, the back of his, uh, Uniform was all 
torn up. So he had gotten a piece of the ARA and um, the shrapnel from the yeah from the rockets. Yeah, yeah. It's very impressive stuff. The way it oh. chewed up the area, deadly. Uh, so I went over and I talked to him for a little bit, and the, the rest of the the patrol walked off and and tried to figure out what was going on. Doc came over with me, and uh, this is Doc Williams again. Doc, Doc yeah. Williams, the um, mobile launch team medic, medic who came. And um, so we let him be for a while. I was going to start an IV on him, and then Doc said, no, nah, you, you don't need to do that. So walked over to where Wilson was, and Wilson was, was able to do, you know, like this with his arm, but that was about it. And he was per, uh, paralyzed. And so now the count has gone up. Now we know we've got two plus Maori non-ambulatory, and you know, um, then we went up the hill a little further, <coughs> and we found one of the the little people uh, who had a, sec a sucking chest wound. And it, it was a good thing that we had Doc there, because he was able to stabilize that, and and uh, and the rest of them were all spread across a line, and you know, none of them were. There was one that was unscathed. One didn't have a single hit on him. But uh, everybody else was, was banged up one way or the other. So we got everybody together. Um, we're still keeping an eye up the hill for the NVA sure. folks who may have been uh, suitably impressed with the, the aerial rocket artillery <laughs> demonstration that they decided to go the other direction. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but we brought were, you critical time, whatever. Yeah. So we... Um, First thing I did was I, I called for some more stretchers. I said, you know, we we got more people that we got to carry out. And um, a Huey came in with the stretchers, and the first one dropped and came down through the trees right where we were. Beautiful. The second one took about a quarter mile turn <laughs> no. the other direction. And so I said, they're probably we'll leave, using we'll it leave today. that to the local people. Yeah, yeah they can they can <laughs> do that. So. Um, now we're set to go, and we've got we've got a a, a big load. Cheney was, you know, a, a big boy, and um, Wilson was a little smaller. Yes, so because he was, Cheney's like six two, six three, two yeah. hundred twenty, two hundred thirty yeah, pounds, somewhere around there. Yeah. I mean, we mean big, yeah, and heavy, big. And there's there's three U.S. that are combat ready uh, on on my team, right? And then uh, we had two of the little people who were combat ready. There's five people to carry all these other folks out. So anyway, we got the, the little people hooked up together and we got the one sucking wound uh, on a stretcher. We got uh, Wilson on a stretcher. And while we're doing all this, Captain Cheney groaned loudly, rolled over and kind of slid down the hill and we rushed over to check on him, and and uh, no pulse. He was he was gone. He was in bad shape as it was. Sure. So anyway, um, at that point, uh, we were ready to pack up. We made sure we got all the weapons. We got all the like you police the area, the rucksacks and yeah. all that stuff. So we didn't leave any footprints or fingerprints. Sure. I guess or souvenirs that they could or use souvenirs. against us. <laughs> yeah. And so we started heading down the hill and uh that was that was a diff it, it was also dark at, by this time night yeah. had fallen and you know so we're going down through this jungle hill with you know in the very, dark very steep slope to oh. it trying to make it out and we got down to the stream and was that when we first we started hearing movement behind us and you know it could have been water buffalo. I, who knows? Or tigers. But you up know, there they had hungry tigers that did attack <laughs> marines in South Vietnam. Yes. When you're, <laughs> when you're in that mode, everything is suspicious. And uh, and plus your little people know they can hear. Yeah. And they're giving you signals already as a one zero. Yeah, you know, go go d d d. Yeah. So we we headed back towards where Maori was. It took us a, a good forty minutes to get the 200 meters from where 
the, the team was down to, to the uh, emergency LZ. And we got down there and uh, called for the, for the folks to come in and get us. For the extraction, yeah. And uh, we got Doc and um, uh, the bodies. Uh, I got them out on the, on the first lift out. And as it took off, the hill up above us opens up with AK fire. Thank heavens it wasn't, you know, something heavier than that. Yeah, yeah. But um, they they got out and they, you know, their door gunner opened up and it was like, oh my goodness, it's New Year's. <laughs> yeah, and it's <laughs> night in the New Year's. And night in the New Year's, and we didn't have nods, we didn't have no. any of that stuff. That was just, you know, what you what you see is what you get. So they got out. Um, second chopper came in. We got that loaded up got gear and, and people on it and uh it got out and then we went out on the last, last so ship. if you're on your elz are you using any kind of strobe light or anything to bring them in or they're just coming in by sheer guts and uh night vision from their eyes adjusting to seeing at night yeah i don't think they didn't have nods on there no They're, but you know we we put out some lights i mean we just shine flashlights up at them Okay. And uh, we were able to get them down to it. But, you know, the, having flown helicopters, yes. I know how scary that must have been. But these guys were rock solid. They just brought it in, brought it to a hover, wow. set it down gently, took what we got. Even when the shooting started, there wasn't any, oh, uh, you know. They let's had get ice in the ground. Veins. They, yeah. And their door gunner was, was firing away and good stuff. So. Um, You're down to your third helicopter. Down to the third helicopter, we got packed up. We heard a whistle, and you know how they use the whistles oh, to. Oh yeah. Yeah, I had one mission where we got trapped out, and and they were they were trying to force us into an ambush. I'm pretty sure. Right. And uh, they were blowing the whistles and all that good stuff. So it was not a not a good feeling. No, because you know so they're coming. Now they're they know they're, they're coming. Fortunately, it was raining. Now it's and raining they, on top of it. No, no, this, oh, the, the, the other, other mission, yeah. the other mission, yeah. And uh, it was raining and it was dark and and they were lazy, and we were able to lay down behind trees and let them walk over us. No. And they walked right through us, and not a one of us got got picked up. It was a five man team, so that was pretty lucky. Oh yeah, that, <laughs> that was that first Vietnamese led team. Yeah. So. Another black bag operation going bad. <laughs> anyway, so I digress. No, no. But we're, we're so, back, yeah. back to, uh, we got them all out. Um, I think by the time we touched down back at, at Fubai, uh, six hours and 45 minutes had, had passed. Wow. So you know, I use this as an example of a, a come-as-you-are sure. party because there was no tailoring, planning, anything. No info, <laughs> hardly. Right, and you had l nothing from the ground other than that we got people shot up by yep. friendly fire. Oh, so that was it was good. But that's was uh, that's a classic example of a bright light, and uh, you were able to get in there with your team. Of course, you're lucky on your team. You had great indige, and yeah. Trung. You still had Trung as your zero one, Trung, the, yeah. your counterpart. I think he was the one who didn't get wounded. No kidding. Yeah, I think he was he was okay. Wow. And uh, and the others were all you know arms and and leg type stuff, but the legs didn't interfere with their walking. Yeah, so, yeah. So you're able to get everybody out. You get back to the base. And so that's a successful mission. But you did whet my appetite a little bit. <laughs> you're in with a five man team. It's night. It's raining. And you lay down in the NVA. We're looking for oh, you. Did you just yeah. walk through your perimeter. You did, didn't give Liv a business card or anything? No. Well, huh? actually, this was supposed <laughs> to be the 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 first uh, LLDB run recon. You okay. Know, this is when we were trying to do Americanization, I mean, uh, Vietnamization, yes. to get them to take over all these. And uh, so at that period of time, uh, in 1969, the term Vietnamization surfaced. And also at that time, in early... 1969, we had the highest number of American troops in Vietnam at that time, which was like 543,000 in country. And after President Nixon was elected in 68, took office in 69, they talked about Vietnamization 
and began scaling back the war. And they were withdrawing troops, and part of that Vietnamization from the Special Forces side was having the LLDB, the Lac Lung Duc Biet, which was the Special Forces trained indigenous troops who could be Vietnamese, Montagnard, or Nung, depending on where you were in the country, what part of the country. And so even in SOG, we had teams trained up like that. And so the LLDB at that time was now, you're talking later 69. Yeah, and you're still with the one zero for <clears throat> Rhode Island. Yeah, well, no, now I'm 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 a floater at this point. Okay, and so it's they said, "Hey, delineate you, that." <laughs> you, uh, AKA strap hanger. Yes, yeah, strap hanger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've worked with these people. Why don't you go out with this team as the liaison? Because this is a oh. Vietnamese planned, Vietnamese run really? operation, and I just brought the black bag just in case. Sure. And so um, you never left home without it. <laughs> never left home without it, except for a bright light. <laughs> so we got we got put in, and we were like ten kilometers off of our planned insertion point. Ten. Ten. Oh. And it was cold. My God, that was the coldest I have ever been in my life. <laughs> Once we got up the side of the Karst Mountain, um, we uh, it started raining early on, and so we're looking for where we're supposed to be and i figured we need to get up get a little bit of elevation and, and some high ground so we could see because we're coming out of a valley going up the oh. side of this karst mountain karst is like glass almost it's got you know little jagged oh, edges and everything like that all of our hands were torn up by the time we got up there went up the side of this thing found some caves really in the dark yeah and climbed <laughs> in the caves and basically we were out I mean, we were so tired from the from the climb and everything that you know we didn't even set security. We being just, cold and wet, being cold and wet just takes it right out of you. And at what point did you know or suspect that the bad guys, the NVA, are looking for you? Have uh, you heard any any any? Uh, I skipped the trackers. Step. Oh, that's okay. I, yeah, that's, that's why right. we that's why we while came we back were, on point. While we were walking around down there in the valley, in the valley, in the we, shadow of death, yeah, <laughs> we started <laughs> hearing these whistles. Ooh, again. And uh, this was this was the start of the of the whistle thing, and it seemed like it was a linear setup. We could hear them, you know, across a line like that. So the the first thing you think about is they're trying to push you someplace. Sure. So that's where you don't want to go. So this is alongside the valley, and so that's why I decided to to cut across and to go up the side of the mountain in order to get up to where I could see where we were supposed to be. So anyway, we we got out there. I suggested to the young lieutenant, the LLDB lieutenant, that it might be a good idea not to go the way they're trying to push us. And he agreed. And so we came up with this idea because we had some scrub trees and so forth there that if we would lay down on our back with our rifle in our hand and let them walk that the worst that could happen would be they might find one of us and you know start shooting and you know it, there was no plan beyond that we were cold and wet and, <laughs> and so oh we my. we did that we laid out there they walked right through us blowing their whistles we saw them go by they didn't have any lanterns they any dog no dogs obviously. no dogs no dogs Whoa. Yeah. Count so your blessings. We, we were lucky on that one and they just they walked through us and kept going. Oh. I wonder what they thought. Where did they go? <laughs> oh, my God. So, you know, after we gave them about 100 yards or so, we oh. got up and, and motioned off to the, to the north and went up the side of the Karst Mountain, found the caves and said, yeah. we're done. And uh, that, you know, I regret that because we should have had security and so forth, but you know, nobody was in shape. You just had the NVA it. walk over you all without a shot fired. Talk about hide and go seek too close. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Mike. So <laughs> then we were up there in the, in the, in the upper Hills. Yeah. And, uh, all of our hands were cut up and everything. And, and, uh, so we went off and tried to find the wire. We couldn't find the wire. The invisible wire. Tap. They had, uh, they had an F4 shot down in the Valley that was not far away or, or shot up. Uh, I don't remember whether there was an ejection or not. But anyway, it was time to get out of town. And so we called in the 
an extraction and we were up on a on a not a pinnacle but we had a ledge out like that there was no place for a helicopter to land up on where we were so they brought in an h-34 and the h-34 is you know that beautiful workhorse oh yeah and the, and Our the dear pilots bees. are crazy yeah king bee king bee come okay and um so we were able to get everybody out out on the edge and they could jump over to the crew compartment and, and get in there and and so forth and, they had, and the, I, the king bee had two the two steps so you could land on a step and get in yeah Whoa. and i'm standing there and then there's some shooting going on and the h-34 starts to move away and i jumped out and grabbed onto the wheel and really fortunately the crew chief reached out and grabbed me by the back of the pack and and pulled me in oh. but that was that was the end of that fun thing and when we got back to base, the uh, the Vietnamese colonel uh, whooped up on that young lieutenant because, you know, he felt like he didn't do a very good job. Oh, my God. He came back alive. Yeah. <laughs> With you. With me. <laughs> so that, that was about it for, for then. And I was very short at that point. Right. Been trying to get into flight school because, as we all know, laying out there in the wet and the cold and the, in the jungle <sighs> at night and watching those airplanes fly over – those guys are going to go back to a hot meal, you know, nice yeah. air-conditioned hooch. And, and so when the Airborne like, Command Centers went over with the C-130s, we always said, well, tonight are they having caviar with their champagne or are they doing fillets? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So that, you know, I, I finally got my orders to, to come home. And, and they, go to flight school? They sent me to the MI advanced course at that point at Fort Hollaberg. Which is military intelligence. Military intelligence. Indeed. And uh, so I went through that for a while. And then um, right after that, I went to flight school. But it was delayed almost up to the to the graduation date of the MI uh, advanced course because there was a problem with my medical. <laughs> And so was that psychological or <laughs> <laughs> after a tour of duty in SOG? Let me tell you, they, <laughs> they, uh, they had a small clinic there at Fort Holliburg. And um, there was a problem, and, and they called from, from uh, the Surgeon General's office and said, you know, we've we got a problem. We need to run this test again. And <laughs> so I said, yeah, okay, what do you want me to do? Go down to the clinic, and we'll tell them what we want. So I go down to the clinic, and um, there's there's this uh, older lady who was the, the nurse there. And she said, oh, yes, uh, Captain O'Byrne, we know. Um, take this slide, and she cleans a little slide and hands it to me. And she said, go into the bathroom and milk your penis down, and whatever you get, put on the slide and bring it back to me. And I'm thinking, Oh my God! What the hell did I bring back <laughs> from Vietnam? <laughs> so we did that, and the results went off. I got another call from the Surgeon General's office, and they said, "We don't understand the results uh, of this test. You, you got to go down there and get it done again." So I go back down there. And they'll tell you see, why. No, see the lady, and she says, uh, "I got to repeat it, huh? Yeah, okay." So we go through that again, send it off again. And it comes back again as uh, doesn't make any sense. And no idea what triggered that. No idea. And, of course, my <laughs> mind's just spinning on this thing. And so they say, go back down to the clinic and have the lady call us, and we'll talk to her. And so I go back down, and, and they talk, and uh, she starts laughing. She thought this was great sport. And um, so she says, okay, uh, roll up your sleeve. Wait a minute. Roll up my sleeve. She said, "From yeah. my penis to my sleeve." Yeah. Okay. The man <laughs> said he won a thick smear, which is a test for residual malaria. Ooh. And she said, "I thought he said he wanted a dick smear." <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we got Speck the blood. Speck English. <laughs> we got the we got the blood test done, and uh, and I got orders for flight school shortly thereafter. So I went, and the Army didn't want to have any more fixed-wing-only pilots, and MI only had fixed-wing airplanes. 
Oh, really? So at, at that time. Yeah, yeah. So they said, okay, you're going to have to go through helicopter school first. So Fort oh. Walters, Texas. Fort Don't Rucker, throw me into that briar patch. Know, Don't. Learning how to do the Huey and all that good stuff. Yeah. And then after I graduated oh, from wait, that. Oh, wait, wait. Just back up a little bit. I mean, I've read the book Chicken Hawk talking about a pilot's firsthand experience about learning how to fly a helicopter. And during my time in Nam, I spent time in the co-pilot seat with the King Bees. I could almost take off. But the controls are so delicate. Oh, yeah. I mean, aren't there a couple little scenarios where you're like your first time trying to hover or just to take off without oh, crashing? It's great, great fun to watch <laughs> the pilots try to learn to hover the first time. Oh, Lord. You know, and, and you've got the collective, yes. which has the throttle built into it. So, right. You know, that, that's the pitch in the blades that makes you go up and down. Indeed. And then you've got the rudders, which control your two pedals the on the floor. And then you've got a stick, the cyclic, which sort of aims it <laughs> and so you have to learn how to coordinate all of those together right in order to take off or land and or just for our listening audience sake people don't realize how sensitive that particularly the cyclic is because you when you see movies with people flying airplanes you see them moving the hands up and down turning and with a helicopter with a cyclic you just think about where you want to go Barely ever touching it. Yeah. Correct? Depending on the what's helicopter. That like? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From an H-34 to a modern-day helicopter, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so but you learned all that. Learned all that, and then had to go to fixed-wing school and unlearn <laughs> how to hover, because fix, fixed-wing airplanes don't hover. Oh, no. We yeah, had that's true. Cessna 172Es, which were souped up and great. Finally got through, almost almost flunked out because I couldn't quite stop trying to hover it on right. a short final. <laughs> and uh, finally got through that. And then the next orders were to go to um, multi-engine. Really? And then after multi-engine and instrument, I went to the Mohawk transition, the OV-1 Mohawk. Oh, yeah, of course. Which is a military intelligence plane. Sure. So it's, Ugly you know, as sin. Oh, beautiful. It's lovely. Oh. Ejection seats? Yeah. Oh, man. Anything's going what on here? I just pull the little ring and psst, psst, you're out. And, and I'm out. I'm back airborne again. So <laughs> went through that. Um, and then they tried to send me back to Vietnam to go to a Mohawk unit, which was the 131st, which was the last Mohawk unit. And, and at this time, you know, you were talking about how many troops were there. Sure. This is 72. And they're down to like under 100,000. Yeah, more like 50,000. Over two 000 years, yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, and not combat units. No. You know, mostly support units. So I got over there, and they said, okay, uh, we're going to send you the 131st to be the property book officer. And the unit is leaving Vietnam in a couple of months. And I said, hmm. Property book, accountability, Ooh. leaving. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what else, you, what else you got? And they said, well, we've got a couple of air cab units that, that could use some pilots. And you are rotary wing qualified, right? I said, of course. <laughs> so they sent me to uh, D Troop 17th Cab. 17th? 17th Cab. Okay. And this was at Da Nang. And um, so I was there for a couple of months. We participated in the 1972 Ooh. spring counteroffensive. Right. And flew in that. The Easter offensive. The Easter offensive. That's when the NBA that's right. came yeah. in. And uh, so I, you know, that was a beautiful scene going up Highway 1. And, uh, oh, I can't imagine. And seeing that, that five-mile-long convoy that was destroyed by the NVA tanks that were sitting up on a ridge above it, bodies still there and all that. Yeah. No kidding. That, that was that was cool, but um, <laughs> and then I wound up in Okinawa on a medevac, and uh, about on a medevac. So what happened to you that required a medevac, sir? We got hit with we with, while you're flying while we're flying. Yeah, in got, a in dropping off a, a Vietnamese Marine unit division or something for, yeah, the, yeah. for the counterattack and um, uh, took a piece of shrapnel in the scrotum. Oh, any brain damage? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> that's one of those that that hurts more than any other place you can get hit. You know, oh, yeah. just about. And it was like, ooh, 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 get me home, get me home. Uh, get so, me to a pecker checker. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we made that out. Got out to Okinawa. They sent me to Okinawa because okay. they wanted to have me close. You know, right? Of course. Like that. With and all that said, talent, we don't think that we just the sanitary conditions are not uh, adequate. We'll send you over to Okinawa, and that way you can do your your uh, recovery, re recovery, recovery there, there, and then and then come on back. And I did. I went on back, and um, and at that point they had an opening in F Troop of the Eighth Cav which was also up at Da Nang. And um, so I went over there, and they needed a scout platoon leader. And I said, oh, this is right down my line. I get to do recon. <laughs> this is the OH-6, you know, the little tadpole-looking oh, sure. thing. Oh, yeah. Flying around a treetop looking for footprints and so forth. So uh, wound up with them. We And one of your tactics, too, was that you had two or three, and the first one would be bait. <laughs> then the second one would follow. So you're not supposed to know that. <laughs> I know, but yeah. that that was a pink team, I think. Uh, oh a God. white team was one, one OH six, one Cobra, and one uh, Huey as the command and control. Right. So we would go out and play this game called pin the map. Pin the map. Pin the map. So you would head into a suspect area. Right. Until you ran into air defense, and then you'd mark the spot on your map or the eight, the command and control ship would mark the spot and you get out as best you could and somebody in in Saigon would stick a pin in the map and um, so then they'd give it a, a couple of days and they'd come in from a different direction and they'd stick another pin in the map when you get shot out of there and then you come around the other way and come in like this what they're doing is just basically setting up the boundary of a whatever area is worthy of having air defense put up with it wow and so um we did that we we finished and and uh, so also at that time just for a point of reference i mean when johnson declared the end of the bombing hall and at the end of 68 the nva began bringing a lot of their anti-aircraft weaponry south yeah, so three years later when you're coming up against you're coming up against everything from 37 mike mike 57 mike mike and something even bigger probably which i yeah. forget what that nomenclature is but the the 12 7 was the one that they used the most in in these oh, that's a, 12 7 is a 50 caliber equivalent yeah 50 caliber but still very effective anti-aircraft weapon oh yeah and once so they get a little the training, sight on the front with the, all that oh, good stuff. And yeah. The guys that, yeah. So we ran into a couple of those and, and escaped them. And um, and again, your so key then, to escaping is being right at the nap of the earth on top of the trees yeah, or skids going through treetops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did a couple of skids. You'd be a little, little the, too modest again. Yeah. So um, let's see. Lost my chain of thought. Uh, but you're talking so, about your oh, missions. Yeah. Yeah. Then they'd bring in Pinpoints. a, a B-52 in the box. Okay. And they'd, they'd B-52 it to, to mess, and then they'd send us back in to see what we found. To do an aerial BDA, bomb yeah, damage assessment. Yeah. And because uh, there wasn't anybody else going to do a BDA out there. No. Right so <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we did that, and on one of these missions coming back, after we had stuck a pin in the map, we were coming back, and, and typically you never fly straight and level any place. So I'm juking around back and forth like that. And all of a sudden, bam, 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 I get hit three times. One of them came through the, the canopy. One of them came through the, the chin bubble and through my right foot. And then one of them went in the, in the back and uh, hit the bleed air band on the engine. And so uh, I couldn't figure out why I was in a, in a crab. I wasn't, you know, because you, you – you control the direction with the rudder pedals. Right. And, you know, I'm, I'm leaning right, right forward front. And um, I looked down, and the top of my boot was like a big flower. Oh. <laughs> I'd taken a 12-7 AP that had come up and gone through my foot and out the other side. Oh. And um, that's why I walk funny these days. Yeah, no wonder. <laughs> so. Uh, oh, my God. So that was the end of uh, Vietnam for me. We flew it 
for a while. I got my crew, uh, not crew chief, he was the, the gunner who sat behind me. Right. To come out through the side of the helicopter, across the minigun, and get in the pilot seat. And we took the extra cyclic stick out and stuck that in and got that that strapped down and I you know so I said this is just in case something happens and and I'm not able to fly you're going to have to fly it aren't you bleeding a little bit from a, from a 12.7 Amazing, going through your foot amazingly not no it was a clean it was a hot shot or something oh it got it seared just, yeah it uh yeah anyway oh my god nice foot yeah <laughs> so talk about a lead foot so we we flew back for a while, and uh, we had been operating out of a base near Nui Badin, sure, the big Black Virgin Mountain, right. And I can see this off in the distance, and so I'm just you know heading for the barn, and the other guys are all following me, and then the engine started feeling a little bit wonky, and uh, so I I put it down in a, in an arc light site, a B-52 strike site, that you know pretty well cleared off all the the terrain there was one tree and i made my approach to the tree <laughs> and was able to get it down and and uh without crashing without crashing another bird came in and and uh the cnc bird picked me up and we went out and then you're officially being medevaced medevaced on my way <sighs> that was purple heart number five number five number five. Oh. so oh my god yeah. okay so so from there, you get medevac. They take you to the. F- now you go back to Okinawa again, so you can stay close. No, or did this it come time, to now. This time they decided to operate there in in uh, Saigon, and uh, yeah, I can I can remember the dock with a wire brush going through, you know, back and forth on that through thing. the bullet hole through in your foot. Through the bullet hole, you know, oh. scrubbing that up. Did he bother to give you any anesthetic at first? Oh, no, because when no. I. When we got to the intermediate base near Te, uh, near uh, Nui Baden, yeah, um, they were evacuating me back, and they, they did. You need anything? I said, Yeah, I need a drink of water. So I got a nice bottle of water, drank that down, and when I got there for the guys to operate on me, they said, Have you had anything to eat or drink in the last hour? And I said, uh, Yeah, had some water on the medevac chopper. And they weren't too happy about that. But anyway, they said, you know, we can't put you under. So they had this pretty Ooh. little nurse come and stand right next to me. And uh, so I couldn't make noises or anything like that. No. And so we got through it, you know. So they literally had to sew you up. They, yeah. They shipped me out of there. They shipped me to, um, where did we go? I remember we were in Texas. <laughs> landed at Lackland Base or something like that, and yeah. then switched over aircraft. Spent the night in the hospital there, and then they they sent me forward, and I wound up um, at uh, Fort Meade, Maryland. Ooh, in the hospital there. Yeah, and we had a little bit more cutting and sewing and all that, and then they they just sent me home. I, it was around Christmas time, and so that was. This fine. is Christmas '72, then. Yeah. Wow. And so, at that point, are you close to getting re- thinking about re-enlisting, or which way am I going to go? Am I going to be a helicopter pilot? Or am I going to be an intelligence officer? Or no, it. I had finished the advanced course, and uh, you know, I was a senior captain at this point. Mm-hmm. And uh, the one thing that the combat arms loved to see in in support people was the CIB and. And, and the Purple and Hearts on your record yeah, to prove yeah. you've been there. And so uh, uh, I got stationed at uh, Fort Huachuca, Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Indeed. Lovely place. Man, I love that place. Were they doing halo jumps back then there? No, no. That's today's. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> I went to Combat Developments Commands and, and worked on some electronic stuff and so forth for a couple of years. And then after that... Um, uh, I, I got orders to go to Germany, and I went over as the S3 of, uh, uh, what did we call it, uh, Aerial Exploitation Battalion, which was a new concept that took RU-21s, you know, doing radio stuff, and uh, OV-1s doing photo and radar, and 
and work them and photo interpretation, put that all into one unit. So what's a UV-21? RU-21. RU, I'm sorry, RU. what is that? That's uh, King Air. Oh. And uh, it's set up with uh, intercept positions and so forth in it. So, you know, you go up there and listen to the radio all day. Which which ASA had in Vietnam. They had agents that yeah. were trained in North Vietnamese. They'd fly over North Vietnam, Laos, listen to, listen yeah. in. I and think they had... I they they, they developed RU. incredible intelligence from those guys. Yeah. I think they had the RUs over there for a while. Okay. Yeah. So here you are. You're gonna but you're gonna operate in Europe behind enemy lines, maybe? So just no, fly over. No, no, or no, this no, is no. this is just straight out, you know, regular <laughs> straight leg <laughs> infantry sure. type support. And uh we would go out and fly air shows every once in a while with the or, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Halfway through this uh, I got assigned as the commander of the 73rd MI Company Aerial Surveillance, which was the OV-1, RV-1 company. Oh, wow. OV-1s for reconnaissance, sure. uh, you know, radar, photo, um, so forth. And uh, the RV-1s were electronic reconnaissance. And that was great. I had 30 airplanes, had 300 people. This was a nice size company. 30 airplanes. Company. Yeah. They're busy. A lot of stuff. Oh yeah, got a lot of, a lot of time in. Um, I used to always fly the the midnight missions or whatever to w during the holidays so that people could be home with their families. My wife didn't think very much of that, but <laughs> yeah, but your men appreciated it. Yeah, absolutely. So I remember one flight when I was up with the standardization pilot. All units have these guys. They they are the gods of making sure you're. Your uh, your acts your, together. Your, yeah, we don't want to say have your shit together. And we used to fly the ra the uh, border around uh, East Germany and and so forth, and uh, we would do it on an autopilot. We'd set it locked in because you couldn't hold the the plane still enough for a radar signal to to be coherent when it was scanning. So we'd put it on this flight director machine. Really. And we fly it, and and it was great because you could sit there and you know smoke and joke and and all that while you were monitoring the instruments just to make sure you were good, and uh, all and this is in the dark. All my of stories course. are in the dark, <laughs> <laughs> and I notice that my dog tags are snaking their way up through my flight helmet, and. Um, that could, be a, that could be an indicator of some trouble. It, it is, but there was no feel to it. I mean, you're strapped down tight in the ejection seat and everything. Yeah. And, you know, maybe if we had ashtrays in it and they'd all lumped it out, <laughs> that would have been a clue. But this was my dog tags, and uh, uh, we had gone inverted on the border. I don't know what we were shooting radar of at that point, but, <laughs> Whoa. you know. And um, so Ernie, the SIP pilot, with me said, oh, got to go home so we punched it off of the flight director and then flew it back manually but uh that was fun there's all kinds of fun stuff like that's like it sounds like a twilight zone <laughs> scenario You're just flying along with the greatest of ease on full yeah. automatic pilot all of a sudden without realizing the aircraft had done a 180 yeah, i wasn't watching the the horizon indicator Oh uh, yeah, you know that we little were problem. Probably chit chatting or something. One of those like indicators that eh, it's not that yeah. important right now. No, the airplane feels fine. You know, there's no sweat. The <laughs> engines aren't roaring or anything. They're just we're just inverting now. Yeah, we had oh. a, had a couple of the Mohawks crash because when we were flying up there in the in in the weather, mm -hmm. uh, ice would form on the front of the pro uh, the spinner out in front of the props. Right, and it would make a big donut. Ooh. And so here you are flying in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden you hear wham like that because the chunk of ice had come off, slid down, hit a blade, and got thrown against the side of the cockpit. And then a couple times it broke off and went into the engine, and then the airplane. So these are Mohawks in Europe? In Europe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We dropped one on, on a German farmer's barn uh, Ooh, he that was had his. Happy. His five Mercedes Benz, <laughs> whatever. It's, yeah, we were we were uh, we had a lot of fun with that airplane. Oh, yeah. little scenarios you never think about. Yeah. So after that, um, I said, "Yeah, not be as a result of the of the the thing. It was right. more 
we were at a point where uh, Jimmy Carter was the president, Ooh. and the budget was cut back drastically, and I didn't have enough money to 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 get parts, repair really? parts, and keep my pilots. So proficient. your flight line of thirty gets cut back. You lose aircraft and manpower. No, we just had hangar queens. We had no planes that we couldn't get repair parts for. I mean, we had a a, a wonderful maintenance section, but they just you know you can't install what you don't have well that, it reminds me of 2015 before the election in 2016 when you had the marine corps going to museums and even army aviation going to museums to get parts for aircraft because the budgets had been cut yeah that's just uh, yeah, that's a story so for another day sir but anyway <laughs> so you're just so i said with that yeah. the peanut farmer is in and you're that's, out that's it i i resigned yeah and uh, it was it was time for me to rotate back anyway, so I just went ahead and resigned, and and then went into the reserves as a backup. But and whereabouts? Um, let's see. I think I I think I separated at Dover Air Force Base. That's where they did my out processing, and then I went down to Atlanta mm -hmm. and uh, went looking for a civil service job. And I got a job as a GS-12 at Forces Command at Fort McPherson. Really? Which is now a movie studio, by the way. Oh, no. <laughs> really? Yeah. And I work, work for the Deputy <laughs> Chief of Staff for Intelligence Yeah. Uh, at Forces Command and stayed there for a while. But the plan had always been to try to find something that would let me go a little bit higher. Yeah, yeah. So I found a job at the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence in the Pentagon. Really? And uh, so I applied for that and moved up there as a GS-13. So you get a promotion, too. Yeah. And the new and better job in the Pentagon, the Puzzle Palace. Yeah, and then worked that for a while and then uh, did a lateral over to a job on the Deputy Secretary of Defense's uh, staff. Uh, the uh, – what do we call that office? I forget – Brigadier General Walt Yaiko used to run it, and, and it was responsible for special projects and, and stuff that's still— Special projects within DOD? Yeah. And so back then, was the um, a DIA beginning to gear up? Are you doing any support for those folks or well, just other this special was, projects this that was were top inter, interagency stuff that's still oh, okay. pretty classified. Indeed. So uh, I went in there as the deputy director as a 14, and then— um, you keep getting promotions all along the way. Oh here. yeah, yeah. Well, this is over a several period, several year period. Yeah, it's still went, pretty impressive though. Went okay, to you're a GS fourteen now. Went to DIA uh, to take a job as a fifteen. Naturally. And, um, and then a couple years later, got a promotion to SES one, over on the uh, deputy chief of staff for intelligence. Uh, so when when you're no, in the, the assistant secretary of defense for intelligence. Okay, because when you're at DIA, was that still basically the intelligence side? Were you doing anything from the yeah, POW yeah. MIA docket at all? Because that was separate. No. no okay. That was separate. So yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. That's quite all right. Yeah, another another so promotion, and another you're doing promotion, intel. And then I wound up eventually as an SES three. Really. The director of intelligence operations, which was an empty title. Right. Uh, but where? But uh, for the uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, still in the Pentagon. Yeah. And then uh, then after a while, I'd had enough of that. It was time to <laughs> retire. My mandatory retirement from the reserves came up, and I thought, well, this is a good time to go. I had taken my, res uh, my uh, military time right. and added it to my civil service time, mm -hmm. and uh, so that let me— retired as a as an se ses3 with a uh, pretty good monthly oh yeah so all that good training that lynn black and i gave you on rt idaho really just i'm came, sorry came back in <laughs> <laughs> so i'm sorry send, I send, send me a bill yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you read so what year do you officially retire from the national guard and your your ses3 uh, 15 position 1995 Wow. Well, you still got time for another career. What yeah. happened next? So then I moved down to Key Largo, Florida, <laughs> and uh, uh, taught scuba diving. 
And uh, civilian now, or are you civilian. working with a couple and, uh, military agencies that do that stuff in their spare is, time this too? This is civilian. Okay. This is fun stuff. Okay. <laughs> and um, uh, ran a charter boat and uh, worked at a dive resort and had a great time. And then I got bored. Bored again. And so I went off to start working on my PhD. And, in uh, um, just in anything, it was it <laughs> turned out to be leadership, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Not to be confused with educational leadership. Oh, indeed. It's just leadership. Yeah. So and where, there's a school that teaches that, or is that one of those in-house deals? Uh, this was the University of Central Florida. Oh, okay. And they hired me as an adjunct professor. They teach and you, then they trained you and hired you? Well, or you just went coincidental, straight in. this was at the same time. It's just part of their program <laughs> to keep people at home. Oh, so you're learning and you're teaching? At the same time. Oh, very yeah. good. Okay, I just want to make sure I had that straight. <laughs> and that's where I met <laughs> my wife. Okay. Samantha, uh-huh. uh huh. She, I, I like to tease her. She took one of my courses, right? Because we needed to have eighteen bodies, or else the course wouldn't go because it didn't right. make enough revenue. Sure. And so I had seventeen, and I talked her into taking <laughs> class. <laughs> and so, so oh we God. got married, and um, and then uh, eventually had my son Connor. Mm -hmm. who is now a specialist fourth in the 310th PSYOP battalion. He's working PSYOPs. Makes you proud. Working PSYOPs. Got yeah. a little lineage going here. <laughs> 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 and uh, we live in Gainesville. Uh, at least it's a Gainesville post office, but we're on the Forsyth County side of Lake Lanier. Got a house on the lake. And, and this is Florida. This is Georgia. Georgia, you sure? Georgia, yeah. Okay. You missed a transition there. I did. That's yeah, why I, that's I'm right. trying to keep up with you, Mike. We had a hurricane come through <laughs> and, and mess up our house. We Ooh. lived at uh, on Merritt Island, mm -hmm. and uh, that was in Florida. Right. And uh, so she, we decided that, you know, we didn't want to be targets for hurricanes. So <laughs> she wanted to move up to where her parents were. Yeah. Uh, they lived down in Roswell, which was... Uh, close into Atlanta, and I wanted to be on the water, and so the only thing that was around was uh, Lake Lanier, which is which is a mud hole. <laughs> so we moved but up there. But it's your mud hole now. Yeah, it's my mud hole. We've got, a, <laughs> we got an enclosed dock, and, and I used to teach scuba down there, uh, limited visibility scuba. And sure. Basically, we did search and recovery training down there because that's you got one foot of visibility maybe you're lucky how do you and find anything uh there's a method oh, i there's bet a method yeah okay you stick a stake in with a rope on it and then you swim around at the end of the rope and then you let it out five feet and then you swim do it again and yeah, do it again until you run out of rope <laughs> or you find what you're looking for <laughs> and then you move the stake and start it all over uh, so that was that was that was fun, and we've been there for 15 years, and and it's a it's a pleasant area. Don't go down to the lake much anymore. I'm just getting too lazy. Usually that old hole in the foot comes back to bother you once it, in a while. It certainly does, as you may have noticed today. I noticed a little gimp there, but I forgot yeah. why. And standing uh, gets to be a problem after a while. So anyway, you know, Absolutely. I get a check for it every month. There you go. Yeah. Well, um, looks like we're at that point. Um, any other reflections back on some of your things you did in the military or any little odd job that we should cover here before we sign off? Because the unique thing is everybody's story is so different. And yours is, again, it's another one that we haven't heard. And it's got so many turns and twists to it. I love it. I'm biased, of course. So maybe not from back in the early parts, mm -hmm. but to the current day, yeah. Um, I belong to a group called the Phantom Airborne Brigade that oh. works out of Zephyr Hills, Florida. And uh, <coughs> it's a bunch of old retired airborne folks. Who are retired. Some of them active duty still. They and, still have parachutes. And uh, they've got a, a bunch of parachutes. I, I purchased my own. I've got an MC6, I think, or is it SF2A? Got I, me. I, I remember the MC6, anyway, but. Static line shoots. Yeah, and uh, so every month they have a they have a jump. Our membership has gone from like twenty four members up to two hundred and forty. Really? And uh, yeah, we have some really big shindigs down there, and it's open. You know, if you got a uh, two hundred and 
214 that says you are jump qualified, <laughs> you can come and jump with us. We is do the LZ sand? Uh, the LZ is grass. Nice, most of the time. Yeah, but underneath the grass is soil that can be pretty hard. Uh, you mean the concrete? No. <laughs> I had one jump where uh, it was right after a hurricane. Right. And there was this area of grass, it looked like. And, yeah. Uh, so I decided to land in it. Sure. And it turned out to be, you know, two feet of water. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so <laughs> I got a little wet on that one. So did my shoot. But uh, it was, you know. I, I don't know how many jumps I've got with them now, but it, it's been a while, and it's a great group of guys. And yeah. If anybody wants to look them up, just, you know, they've got uh, phantomairborne.com, I think, is the is the website. No kidding. And go what, sign so up. So what elevation are they jumping at? Uh, 1,500 normally. Yeah. Because jump school was 1,250 feet, the same height as the Empire State Building. <clears throat> that was the training jump. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I never knew that. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, we had uh, the last water jump was at Lake Dora. And uh, that's over a little bit to the, to the east from uh, Zephyr Hills. And um, they, they get the local community involved in it. Everybody shows up with their boat and tries to catch a parachuter. We jump out of a, out of a C-47, the Tico Bell. Uh-huh. And um, that, that's great, uh, going out the door of an old World War II. That was actually a D-Day bird. No. And so, you know, that, that's always fun. And then there's also the Round Canopy Parachute Team. Right. It's another group I belong so to. So basically jumping T-10s. Yeah. Oh. People do that to themselves where they could get a really nice steerable? Yeah. I, no, I think Round RCPT's got uh, steerables. The, yeah, yeah. The, the but the T tens though, they're just like yeah, jump that's, school. Yeah, you have to pull for half an hour just to that's, try to get a change in direction a little bit. That's why they jump at twelve hundred. Remember when they wanted to do uh, <laughs> insertions? Yes. Daisy chain the little people, so that you know when the first one went out, he opened the second one and so on like that. So they keep everybody together. Yes. And uh, yeah, that five hundred foot jumps are are not fun. No, 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 no. Yeah, through I. At CCN, uh, during my second tour, I don't know if you, had, if you had transferred out yet or not, but they were talking about the whole jump thing. And we didn't know that they had jumped as early as uh, November of 68. They had the first static line jump, which I think came out of CCC or CCS. I know it wasn't us. And uh, it's like jumping into Laos into triple canopy? Ixnay. That was my first thought. But you, they did it. Do you remember the, the discussion about uh, a pallet? extraction <laughs> you know they'd fly over to cut the engine come in slow and then toss out the sh the pilot chute and it would pull the team out on a pallet no no fortunately that one never got never got tried very what good what else was there um there was <laughs> they the, could all the die together in one pilot yeah, right. <laughs> you know the mouse there's gonna be a malfunction somewhere <laughs> <laughs> and uh uh there was the 500 foot jump thing and, right uh yeah bunch of this was back when dick meadows was there and and we were looking at at different things to do sure because you all know you don't want to have a reception committee no we try to do anything of course it, at that time we knew we were compromised we just didn't know how badly or severely oh, yeah. we were compromised yeah. and we're going to cover that on another topic and they have to call you back on that <laughs> But you were in it, and you were in the Intel office for a little while there. Was there any other indicators besides the fact that when the sapper attack came on August twenty third, sixty eight, hit the camp hard? They had great intel, and then we had teams that ran into issues like Pat Eddington, when um, his mission was to go to the American POW camp. He's en route to the camp, and the guy comes up on the radio. I'm at the camp. I know where you're gone. You're Pat Eddington. You're from RT Cobra. And he says, you got a choice. You can turn around and go home or continue to the POW camp, and I will execute every American here. So Pat Ainton turned around and came back. So our s compromise factors were. Yeah, there was somebody <sighs> down there in Saigon that, that we was had that reading spy. all the mail. And then we had the, uh, um, when the uh, North Koreans seized the USS Pueblo in November of 67, they did so at the Russian behest. 
And when they landed in port, the Russians came in and took out all the equipment, took it to Cambodia. And then at that point, the Johnny Walker spy ring was starting to sell the, the daily cat codes and stuff to the Russians. And so they combined them. They had their insights into our intel, highest communications for a few years before they realized it. Yeah. And Scary. And still we got stuff done. Whew, only by the grace of the Lord or oh somebody yeah. looking over our shoulder there. So any final thoughts, sir, as we close down? I want to thank you for taking time from uh, today. We, By the way, we we're recording at the third Special Forces Group and uh, third the headquarters. Of the third third of the third here at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, yeah. in the middle of a SOG symposium. And uh, But thank you for taking time. Any final thoughts closing out here, Mike? Go Army. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, with that, um, we want to, as always, we thank um, today's military, the service members, the Border Patrol, our first responders, the people that are working at the hospitals during this COVID virus, and our, even our educators now that seem to be are the parents of educators that are on the front line fighting for freedom in America. Um, we also thank the women and the men and women who have served our country in years past, our heroes. Men like Mike O'Byrne, who besides being a good friend was one hell of a soldier. We thank him, and last but not least, we remember and salute the men and the women who are still missing in action who couldn't be here today. And we also close out, we thank Jocko Willink Productions for making this all possible. And uh, we will be back with episode number 17 soon. Thank you. God bless America. <laughs> Got your COVID shot? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I've gotten both and a booster. <laughs> and I'm you're gonna, alive? I'm going to live forever. There we go. <laughs> On that note, we're signing off. <laughs> <laughs>